Okay, so this is the first lecture on animals, animal structure and function in our biology 1200 class at Vancouver Community College. So welcome students. So what we're doing in 1200 is instead of looking at specifically the anatomy and physiology of humans, we're doing a comparative anatomy and physiology style investigation into animals. So a case study that I thought I would present to you because it's dear to my heart is uh, herons and humans, comparing herons to humans. And doing this uh, gives us more information about human anatomy and physiology as well, but also the origins of um, various features like digestive systems, circulatory systems, and how animals handle their environment metabolically. So herons are right outside my window. So if I were to look outside, which I'm doing right now, into Stanley Park, there, there is a heron colony, and this is it right here. And you might notice already that there are some different colors in these green trees. So they're kind of uh, white here and here. Well, that's guano. So that's the herons that are living for the summer while they're nesting and breeding in the trees. So this is the heron colony in Stanley Park. And so herons look like that. That's the great blue heron. And during breeding season, they get more fancy feathers like many birds do. So in this case, they get uh, breeding feathers filamentous ones on their back and on the front. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how that got in there. Um, so what is our common theme? What is the common theme of all animalia? What is the common theme of birds and humans? Well, one of them anyway is form fits function. Um, that's inseparable really when you're studying uh, any living organisms, form fits function. So in the case of locomotion, for example, we might be studying the locomotion of various animals. Well, birds have wings. And since we're doing a human bird comparison, uh, humans have legs. So the birds have wings and the humans have legs. So how are they adapted to their particular environment? Well, uh, let's take a look. Some things are quite similar. These are called homologous structures. For example, the femur. Herons and humans both have femurs. So herons, like most birds, can walk as well as fly. This isn't actually a heron, by the way, this one, this is another kind of bird. But I wanted to have just a skeleton. Um, also the, the tibia and fibula, they're also homologous. So they have those for walking. So the skeletons are similar in many ways. This is the vertebrae, the spinal column of the bird and the vertebrae back here here, the human. So they are both vertebrates, but their vertebrae, their spines are articulated differently in that the bird has a long, long neck. And it even uses its neck differently in that it, it uh, lunges at prey in the water. Other things that we have in common are Changing gases. So this heron is yawning. So I have noticed when, with studying the herons that once the chicks that they have, and they have like four large chicks per nest, they're feeding them constantly, and they get very bedraggled looking and, and really tired looking. Um, and they yawn. So like humans yawn. Why do we yawn and what triggers it? Very similar 
in that if you have shallow breathing for a while, or if you're using up a lot of oxygen, you do have a buildup of carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide increases uh, the pH of your blood, and that can trigger you to yawn. Triggers yawning. But of course, there's another kind of yawning when sipping like them. Did that cause you to yawn? If it did, it's called uh, it's called social, it's socially triggered yawning or something like that. So I don't think anyone really knows why that happened. Well, that could be. If you if you didn't yawn, then you might be a cold person. All right, here's a baby yawning. Similar function. These, this is an adult heron here, and these are the chicks. So there are three chicks, and all of them want food from the parent. This could be a male or female, they're indistinguishable. Um, so somehow the bird has to get food to its chicks. It's quite a different way than mammals do it in that the birds regurgitate their food. And they have a very particular esophagus in order to be able to do that. And what the chicks do, so I took this picture a while ago, but the chicks like grab, here's the beak of the adult here. And the chick here is grabbing the beak of the adult and that triggers the adult to regurgitate the food. For the chicks and the chicks are they're vying for the adult food and they're grabbing the beak and they want to be the first one to get the food but of course for humans as in other mammals feeding of chicks is through breastfeeding and then i found this one too i thought that was really cute little baby a bottle holding with its feet so how is the physiology of the human and the heron different in order to uh, facilitate these different feeding methods and different eating methods? So the digestive systems are, of both are quite uh, different, although there are many similarities. So both have an esophagus. Um, both have a small intestine, a large intestine, that perform very similar functions. And um, they both have livers that are very large. The liver's function in both is to detoxify food. But a difference, and you've probably seen this already, is that the bird has a crop and a gizzard. The crop is there to hold food. So when the bird goes out and feeds in the ocean or wherever it feeds, store some of that food in the crop, and that way it can bring it back to the chicks. Humans don't have that. The only person that regurgitates food as a human, as far as I know, is uh, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, <laughs> played by Jim Carrey, if you remember. Um, yeah, so the gizzard is another different structure in that birds, have mechanical digestion by feeding on little rocks and that helps to break down food mechanically in the gizzard before it even gets to the stomach. With humans, the mechanical digestion is really with muscles that surround the stomach. So there are circular muscles, longitudinal muscles and oblique muscles and they all help to mechanically um, digest food, making the food smaller and easier to digest by enzymes. So for humans, there are um, two different structures, one for reproduction and one for waste. So the rectum and the anus are for waste. For the bird, the cloaca handles both. It handles both. 
nest building. You think that's something humans don't do, but they do. Um, for this particular heron is carrying this nice large twig and the, the male will carry the twig back to the nest and the female then will weave the nest. There are very specific functions held by the male and female. You can always, even though they look similar, um, the males and females, you can tell the male because it's flying back to the nest with the twig. So that's how you can distinguish them. It's really the only way. The female's just a little bit larger. It has a larger uh, pullman, for example. I think it's 17 centimeters for the female and 14 for the male. Do uh, humans nest? Sure they do. They build houses. So the male has to be able to carry the twigs. So its form, in other words, the size of its colman, allows it to carry a twig back to the nest. Whereas humans, of course, they have visible thumbs and they're able to carry tools. So form fits function, whether you're a heron or a human. And of course, all of those functions contribute to fitness and survival. And this was a far side I found that was really funny. But these two, these two bought this nest, but they got it at a deal <laughs> because it's upside down. So cute. Okay, so that is the end of the case study. Let's look at unifying principles of anatomy and physiology. So now we're looking at, of course, animal anatomy and physiology. One unifying principle is cell theory. So for us, that's of course for all life forms. Cell, cell theory, all structure and function result from the activity of cells. It all goes down to the cellular level. Um, another unifying principle is evolution. So the animal body, as with all living things, is a product of evolution molded by years of natural selection. There is a unity of form and function. So that's just what we've been talking about. Physiology cannot be separated from anatomy. There also with uh, the animal form is a hierarchy of structure. So cells are the simplest and then the structures get more complex as they combine to form things like organs. And homeostasis is also an important unifying principle, maintaining stable conditions within the body. And that is Homer Simpson. Maintain stable conditions by drinking beer and watching television, I guess. So structure fits function. And we saw in the, in the video that uh, there are a lot of odd structures that animals have, like the cuttlefish, for example, like octopus, um, all um, cephalopods, they have chromatophores in their skin and the chromatophores can change color with various pigments, but also texture. And that fits the function of the animal escaping from predation or hiding in order to predate on something else. So to sneak up on something, for example. So this, I don't know if you recognize this person, you might be too young, that's Fred Astaire. And he did a movie where he was dancing, he was a famous dancer. And in some of the movie, he was dancing on the walls. And in some of the movie, he was dancing on the ceiling. Well, of course he had special constructed room with pulleys and wheels. So he was dancing and they moved the room around for him. But something like a gecko, so this is Fred Astaire, <laughs> and this is a gecko, and the gecko can climb on the walls and climb on the ceiling with no problem. And the reason is that the feet of the gecko have structures known as setae. So these are setae, and they have teeny tiny little 
kind of suction cups at the end. But the main reason why they can, uh, the main reason why they can stick to the ceiling or the walls is because of van der Waals interactions between their sete and the walls themselves. Van der Waals interactions allow them to do that. So that's how the form of the sete, including the chemistry of the sete, allow the gecko to walk up the walls to catch flies. There's another good example, albatross wings. Uh, albatross are very large birds. And you know what? They spend all of their life, except when they're breeding, at, in the ocean. Flying over it, most of the time, they have enormous wings. They have a, a wingspan of, I got this wrong, but I think it's something like three meters. And they use the updrafts that come off the water to glide over the water without expending too much energy. And the wings of birds are really quite remarkable. Their structure really fits their function. They don't just have one function. So in order to fly, it takes a lot of energy. How can you save energy? Well, you can have hollow bones. That helps. Birds have hollow bones. A lot of the structures are uh, homologous to mammal structures, like the, um, the ulna radius. Another form of the feathers is that this is the shaft of the feather. It's also hollow, saving weight. It has little bars that come off the shaft. The shaft have little barbules, and each barbule has a little hook. And those hooks hook together with the other shafts, the other feathers, so that they're smooth. So here you can see there's a gap here and there's a gap here. But the bird will groom itself in order to close those gaps and rehook each, um, each bar to the other bars. And feathers are also there for warmth. So this is a downy feather. You'll find those underneath the flying feathers and their function is warmth. And I don't know if you've ever had a down blanket or a down pillow, but they are very warm. The feathers are thin, but there's very many of them. So basic principles of form and function. This is a moth. I just saw a really good show about um, about pollination. And this is a hawk moth, and it has a very close relationship with this orchid in that it has an extremely long tongue that can get right down to where the orchid provides nectar. The animal world is extremely diverse, as diverse as the plant world. Diverse worms, but common challenges. You find animals everywhere, every part of the biosphere where life can exist. Um, the, these comparative studies that we do show that form and function are closely related. Um, anatomy is the study of structure. So we call that anatomy. Uh, tone means to cut in Greek. Um, and physiology is the study of function. So anatomy, Structure, physiology, function. Well, animals can't uh, just be any size. They're, you won't find um, mammals, for example, smaller than a shrew. As far as I know, anyway, the shrews are very small, probably one of the smallest animals there are. And it has a problem. It has a problem in that its surface area ratio is very high compared to its volume, which is lower in comparison. So it loses heat all the time. How 
does it handle that situation? Well, shrews eat a lot. Shrews eat at a constant rate and they eat um, a lot, like their body weight in, I can't remember, a day or something like that. But they need to eat a lot because they are endotherms. They maintain their body heat with their metabolism. And so eating is um, metabolism. All of that food needs to be digested. That releases heat as a byproduct. So being able to perform certain actions depends on the animal's shape and size. And what's really neat is if you look at different parts of the world, you see something known as evolutionary convergence. So that reflects how uh, animals adapt to the environment over evolutionary time. So Australia, for example, uh, that was part of South America. When Pangaea broke up, that part of South America and Australia broke off. And the mammals there evolved to be uh, marsupial, whereas in the rest of the world, they evolved to be placental. But the interesting thing is, sorry. <laughs> Pausing. But we're back. We're back with physical laws and animal form. So let's look at evolutionary convergence. Um, I don't know if you've been to Australia, but I highly recommend it because you'll see animals that are quite, quite different from North American animals, but they're adapted in very similar ways because they have similar environments. They have forests, they have grasslands, they have deserts, and the animals have uh, adapted accordingly. Well, here's a good example of adaptations depending on the environment between very different animals. Here's a tuna fish, a tuna, a shark. So a fish, a shark is a fish, a penguin, a mammal, a dolphin, a mammal, and a seal, a mammal. What do you notice about their body shape? So they all have very particular body shapes for swimming, even though they're not all fishes. There are birds, fishes, and mammals. And one thing that they have is a torpedo-shaped body. So even though they're not all in the same group of animals, they have a body that's relatively narrow at the back, widens, gets narrow at the front, widens and gets narrow at the back. And then they have either fins of some sort at the back or their feet are adapted as in the seal, they've become paddles and they're located at the back of the animal. And those adaptations, their body forms are adapted to water. And that form, this torpedo shape, fits the function of swimming for all of those animals. So every animal has to exchange materials with its environment, with its surrounding. And we're talking about small things like carbon dioxide and nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, glucose. They're very small. The way that cells obtain these nutrients are through diffusion, either facilitated or active diffusion. So they must be dissolved in an aqueous medium in order for them to diffuse. And in that way, they're transported across the cell's plasma membrane. Well, sure, that's easy for a single cell protist that lives in water like the amoeba that we looked at at the beginning of the term. There's lots of surface area. Surface area is a big thing, by the way, in all life function. The surface area of the plasma membrane can service the whole cell, the cytoplasm. So 
So here's a, an amoeba. You probably recognize it. Very easily diffusing materials across the plasma membrane. Well, here's a nadarian. This is a hydra. Very small nadarian. And it's just got two cell widths to its body. Still very easy to just diffuse materials from the surrounding water for the whole animal. Yeah. So it takes in food through the mouth into this gastrovascular cavity. And there, the materials can diffuse into the cells and just diffuse into neighboring cells. It's a very simple animal. But animals have grown larger and more complex. So that animal, only two cells thick, no problem. Like a, the sac is the gastrointestinal cavity. But if you're more complex, larger, then you have highly folded areas for exchanging materials. You need to have a lot of surface area to exchange gases and nutrients and waste with the environment. So here, for example, is a multicellular organism. When I talk about increasing surface area, I'm talking about things like the lining of the small intestine. It's all villi. All these villi are lined with cells, lots and lots of cells. And they're all absorbing material from the intestines. Another example is the lungs. The lungs have al alveoli. They're very, very, very small sacs, and they're lined with cells. But together, all of those alveoli are about the size of a, of a tennis court, the surface area. And the kidneys are all microtubules that have enormous surface area in order to cleanse your blood. So there is a kind of structure that is like a tube within a tube. So here's, for example, the digestive system is a tube within a tube, which is the body. There is a circulatory system that extends throughout the body of a multicellular animal, delivering oxygen, delivering nutrients, removing waste, removing carbon dioxide. And it's delivered to all of the cells of the body. So that's what you need for a multicellular organism. There is a structural hierarchy. Single cells will absorb nutrients, yes. But single cells generally can't function very well for a multicellular animal all by themselves. No, they have to get together as a team and function. So for example, this is the mucosa of the stomach. Those are epithelial cells and they line the stomach. Underneath the lining is what's known as a submucosa. That's connective tissue. So that's uh, very uh, loose numbers of cells, lots of fibers, but the fibers have space to allow for blood vessels and nerves. So this is how you can service a multicellular organism with organs like this. Underneath the connective tissue, there's the muscularis, that smooth muscle. And of course, the smooth muscle can move um, food through the digestive system. So you have like a tube, and you'll have circular muscles that squeeze the tube, if it's the, if it's the esophagus or the intestines, and longitudinal muscles that will push food down the tube. Squeezes and elongates, sort of like milking a cow in a way. And that's how the food gets transported through the tubes of the digestive system. So, this is what I mean by a hierarchy. 
at the lowest level of the hierarchy, the multicellular organism, you've got a cell. In this case, it's an osteoblast. It's a cell that makes bone. The tissue is considered connective tissue. So these are the concentric layers of compact bone. Uh, the organ of the skeletal system is a series of long bones and flat bones, different kinds of bones. They make up the skeleton of the individual and um, the la well, hang on, wait, no, that's the system there. Oh, hang on. The organism in this case is short. So that's a functional hierarchy of the skeleton. So tissues are groups of cells with a common structure and function. And that is our next topic. So I'm going to stop there and we'll start again shortly. <laughs>